Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance be forgot and the days of old lang syne? Happy New Year to everyone who's watching this live stream. Um, it's the new year coming up and I want to talk about the song. Actually, that's the New Year's Eve song that everybody sings. Old Lang Syne basically equates to once upon a time. It equates to times long past or the ancient times. That entire song is about people who knew that they might forget one another. They might forget um, everything that's gone on. So they bring it to mind. They remember once upon a time. They recall the fantastic times that um, that we once lived in, that our the conditions in our world used to be much different, which allowed for things like giants and magic and trolls, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Welcome, everyone. This is Truth in Movies, and today we're breaking down the Netflix movie Troll, where we're going to talk about uh, myths, legends, folklore, and the truth that resides within all of those things. <laughs> Happy New Year! Hey, blow up the chat! Come on, blow up the chat with some fireworks and some uh, some champagne and whatever you guys got. Go ahead and blow it up. <clears throat> We're going to jump right into this Netflix movie Troll. And we start things off by looking at what are known as the Troll Peaks. This is a real place um, called the Troll Peaks. Troll Tendene. And uh, if we look it up in in Google, it says that the Troll Wall, this place right here is called the Troll Wall, um, in Romsdal is the highest vertical mountain wall in Europe. It's over a mile tall from the valley to the top of the wall. That's how tall these things are. And this entire movie is going to be located, if you pull up your map, you can zoom in on Norway, the lower section of Norway. That's where this takes place in the northern lands up there. Big shout out to Heather Thunderhawk, who I know lives in Norway, I'm pretty sure. Um, so we start things off by seeing the main character, this girl. We're going to meet her in a minute. She's younger now. Oh, thanks for all the donations in advance to everybody. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm going to continue with the video though and give a huge uh, thank you to everybody at the end. So this girl's a rock climber. She's out there with her dad climbing rocks. Check this out. You can barely see her. Look how tiny we are in comparison to the rest of the world. You see that right there? That's the girl climbing up the face, the sheer faced cliff, which by the way, how did it get like that, right? Is it wind and rain over millions of years or is it more sudden? I think it's more sudden. Now, they climb up to the top of this mountain, and as you can see here, there's actually a couple of cairns. There's some rock piles that are stood up on a pile at the top of this mountain. Let's check that out real quick. We asked the question, what are cairns, right? Not cairn, <laughs> but cairn. It's actually related. It's directly related. Um, it It's related to the word horn, right? Horn, horn, cairn, same, same type of origin. So these are rock piles that people have set up all over the world. People start stacking rocks. I'm not talking about just for fun, just for balancing the rocks or whatever on the trail. But in the ancient days, people set these up as markers and they would set up these stone towers or whatnot. Now, there's lots of uh, reasons that this could have been for. Personally, I think that they were markers um, to, to help them on their journey and they lined them up with the blue beams that shot up out of the world so that they can know um, which way to go. It also could be for protection too. People made like little houses and stuff out of these. So her and her dad get to the top. They get to the summit of this mountain and the dad says the troll peaks. These are called the Troll Peaks, this mountain that's been petrified. It looks like it's just been pulled right up out of the ground and then solidified instantaneously. These are the Troll Peaks. This movie's called Troll, so let's dive into the etymology and check out what the word troll means. Where does it come from? In uh, this etymology website, it says from Old Norse, troll, which means giant being not of the human race, an evil spirit, a monster. Some speculate that it originally meant creature that walks clumsily and derives from Proto-Germanic Truslan. Uh, Truslan. And uh, also it seems to have been a general supernatural word such as the Swedish word trolla, which means to charm or to bewitch. And it also comes from the Old Norse trodomer, which means witchcraft. So the trolls were not just in the ancient times or the old Lang Syne. They weren't just um, clumsy, stupid beasts that were 
nothing like humans whatsoever. It's just that at times they were seen as that, depending on how people experienced, uh, had their experience with the trolls. But they were strongly correlated with magic and magic abilities. These trolls had magic abilities. Now, where does the word troll come from, right? They don't really know. Nobody really knows for sure. I couldn't find any etymological roots for the word troll. So I have my own research and my own theory, which I'll share with you now. I believe it's related to many different words that we have today, including the word trail, right? The word trail means to track or smell, a track or a smell that's left behind by a person or an animal. It's also directly related to the word droll. Uh, if you speak French, something is droll, how droll people say, right? Which means how funny. Hi, in high German, trolle means clown. Ultimately, from the Old Norse troll or a giant or a troll. Um, I believe it's also related to travail or to work or uh, trail or stuff like that. Um, basically, I believe that the trolls were called such because they left behind trails. They left behind smells that people can smell where they were, right? Because they have a strong odor. They also left behind physical evidence of where they went because they're so gigantic. So literally they are the trail blazers. They are the trail makers, the trolls. And then it, we, we see back on top of the summit of the mountain here, they say that the sun rose and turned them to stone and now they're mountains. Is that true? Is there any truth to that, we should say, right? Uh, it harkens back to the legends of instant petrification and petrification weapons that were used by the ancient gods of old, by giants, witches, warlocks, magicians, wizards, etc., to turn those who were seen as being evil or enemies of people into rock, instantly petrifying them, just like Medusa, right? Which Medusa we've talked about is the hole that opens up in the sky, the depressurization point when our atmosphere depressurizes, the hole opens up in the sky and all the red plasma that is surrounding our world starts spiraling in with these uh, plasma snakes, I call them, or plasma uh, branches or whatnot. And they come down and some of those are strong enough of an electrical charge to petrify organic material instantly. And other things as well. Here's a couple of examples too. These are examples of myths of uh, actual places where they say that the, the rocks used to be living creatures. Uh, it says here, three black basalt columns called the Reynes Drangar protrude from the stormy North Atlantic. Legend has it that the rocks are three trolls caught out too late and frozen by the early morning sunlight. From the wild black beach of the foot of Vik, the towers can be seen off the misty coast. And uh, this is what they look like right here. As you can see, it looks like uh, the trolls were dragging a ship or something and it petrified. Now, my theory on this is that um, uh, whenever the world depressurizes, there is an increase in buoyancy, a boost in buoyancy, basically, that causes many things to become weightless. And, um, and the mud and the muck and the mire... Uh, are attracted to those plasma snakes of Medusa that come down into our world. And electricity literally, physically pulls the parts of the world up into the air. And whenever it, it hits that electrical charge, it petrifies, creating uh, stronger bonds within, uh, within the mud, petrifying it, turning it into rock. Here's an interesting one. There are many of these world, the world across, okay? There are many, many of these across the plane of existence that we live on. There's thousands upon thousands of examples of sleeping giants, mountains that have these uh, stories about how they were once giants, but they were petrified and turned into rock. This one's very interesting. I want to share this one with you. Uh, this one is... It, it's just like a natural obelisk that's shooting up out of the ground. I think this is in Scotland or, uh, yeah, it's in Scotland. This one is called Maggie Carlin. Check this out. I'm going to share this in a separate video another time, but this is a short excerpt. Uh, Maggie was a Carlin, a lowland Scots word for an old hag or a witch, a magical person. And uh, basically the story of Maggie goes... Let me share this with you. The story of Maggie the Carlin goes like this. She was the most feared of all of the magical people, of all of the witches and sorceresses in the land. 
and she became haughty and she became pompous in her power and her abilities. So one day she challenged the devil himself to a standoff, to a wizard's duel, if you will. And she came out and she was throwing lightning up at the sky. She was battling the devil. All throughout this narrative, the devil is seen as being in the sky, not coming up out of the pits of hell from below, but coming down from the sky itself. The devil stretched out the sky, tore it in half. Um, lightning was seen from the east to the west all over the place. Boulders were being hurled down from the sky, random boulders that just settled wherever they happened to fall. <clears throat> An epic battle, battle between Maggie, uh, Maggie Carlin and the devil himself. Now, the devil got pissed off at Maggie, basically, and threw so many boulders down that they encased her, turning her into stone and turning her into rock. Other legends say that the devil shot her with a bolt of lightning and she petrified and turned into stone, just like Lot's wife in the Bible, right? Remember Lot's wife? You're going to see a lot of um, people turning into stone, trolls turning into stone symbolism when the sun comes out. Just like in the Bible, it actually says this, that uh, Lot's wife was not turned into stone until the sun rose. The sun came up, uh, the, the fire and brimstone came down, and Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt, or petrified, if you will. Uh, this one says, uh, oh, this is actually the quote from the Bible. It says, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah out of the heavens. So these destructions come from above, right? We often associate some sort of an evil place like hell or something as being under the earth. But in reality, many of these ancient myths and legends talk about being, being wary of the sky, being cautious of what's going on up there in the heavens. It also is related to the menir. A menir it means a man stone, basically. So you'll see these long standing stones, the world across and all of the legends indicate that these used to be organic beings of some kind. And the stories say that they became petrified, usually during some sort of cataclysmic event. Here's some other examples of standing stones, the world across, right? Not all of these can be explained. Like this one right here, <laughs> this one cannot be, some of these are growing out of the ground, okay? These are not things, not all of these are things that you can say, well, the ancients, you know, they, they, they used pulleys and ropes and they dragged them from one place to another. No, no, no. Some of these are connected to the earth themselves because they were pulled up from the earth and petrified. So the daughter's like, yeah, yeah, I know the trolls were mountains, blah, blah, blah. And the dad with all seriousness says, there's some truth to every fairy tale. She says, they're just mountain peaks. Just, ooh, that's a, <laughs> that's a word for people who don't wanna look any further or who can't see it, basically. It's just this, it's just that. Oh, it is that in all of its wonder and glory, it is that. He says, believe believe and look again, right? Because uh, if you believe and then you look, you might be able to find something. So she looks again. She takes a good close look at the troll peaks and the closer she looks and the more she opens the right side of her mind, her imagination, she begins to be able to actually make out some faces. As you can see here, 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 she starts to see the faces of the trolls that are petrified within the mountain itself. And he says, made of earth, and stones. Troll. That's the beginning of our film. We're going to have a good time on this one. All right. So uh, if you haven't seen it already, check out this. This is a great example. This is one of my videos on my channel. It's got over 2 million views. And uh, this is in Maya Bay. This is actually a titan, or it seems to be to me and to many other people, a titan that, that is lying there petrified in Maya Bay. And there might be evidence for many more of the same in Maya Bay. Here's another one that I found too. This is just some sort of a commercial or something for this, uh, whatever it is, this girl's meditating. But then look over here in the corner. You can see another one. This is another video that I made on my channel too. It's called Petrified Giant. Uh, you can see it there. You can see I, I found a video where some guy's walking around. This one's in Hawaii um, where they filmed Jurassic Park actually. And you can see it again. You, from multiple angles, you can see these creatures, right? All right, so now we go into the future where that same little girl is now a paleontologist. So they're out there in the field digging and looking for fossils and whatnot and says, has anyone seen our fearless dino hunter? From uh, So she actually uncovers a dinosaur fossil. It says, from a time of giants, just like a fairy tale. She says, this is no fairy tale. 
And so they uncover this uh, T-Rex looking fossil or whatnot. I fully, fully have a theory. I don't, I don't want to say like I fully believe, but I have a theory that the dinosaurs are basically phantozoids, right? Or giants or trolls or whatever was left over from the old world, the time of gigantic uh, proportions, the time of gigantism in our world where everything was huge and monstrous looking in comparison with those things of today, right? Uh, much of this movie kind of <laughs> you'll see in the future, but a lot of this movie sort of kind of copies a little bit from Jurassic Park, but still, it's actually a really good flick. It's done in another language, but, and usually I, I don't watch those kinds of movies because it's dubbed over in English, but they did a great job. Let's check out the word dinosaur. All right. So if you look up the word dinosaur, you'll see that it breaks down into uh, denos from the Greek, dinos or denos, which means terrible or awe-inspiring or fearful. Uh, and sauros, which means lizard from Soros, right? Now, if we look up Soros, so terrible lizard, right? But if you look up Soros, which is supposed to mean lizard, it says it's a, fo a form of Greek, uh, which means lizard, a word of unknown origin. Well, that's easy to break down. We can find the origin of that. O-S is just a suffix and it means strong or strength or very strong with. So that's the suffix. The root is sar or shar, which basically means a leader, a prince. It's the root of the name Sarah or Sara or Sari. And it comes from sar, which means prince or rulers. So the dinosaurs were the terrible, strong rulers or strong leaders, just like a prince, right? Now, we our movie takes us to a place in Norway called the Dover Mountains. The Dover Mountains, and it says here, uh, this is actually pretty important because of that particular mountain, the root of the word Dover means deep. Remember when we broke down um, Lord of the Rings and they went to Helm's Deep for safety? It represents the center of the world. It's a type of Mount Maru. It's a type of Yggdrasil or Hodmimi's Holt, where um, Leif and Leif Berzir, the Norse equivalent of Adam and Eve, they go to hide during uh, everything that happens during the book of Revelation, Ragnarok, the end times, etc. So it comes from the word that means deep, right? Dover means deep. It also uh, can mean forested valley, which is very interesting because that, that valley that surrounds those four lands that used to be on our maps of the North Pole and Mount Maru was right in the middle, those four lands were said to be a valley that were surrounded by uh, very tall mountains. And it also can mean a hole which is appropriate because uh, Mount Maru is a hole that goes into the inner recesses of the earth. Now, I took a picture of this because it looks like the government is building something in Dover Mountain, right? So they've gone and taken over this mountain. It says Dover Banen, Dover Banen. Banen means to make way or to make clear. It can also be translated as like tracks or trails or things like that. So it is to make a path, to make a clear way to Mount Maru or or two within the inner hollows of the earth. Also, this is where you get the symbolism of the song in the Hall of the Mountain King, which is that song that goes right? You've heard that one. Uh, that one is in, Nor in Norwegian. They don't call it the Hall of the Mountain King. It's called Dover Gubin's Hall. There's the connection to Dover, right? To the deep hall. So uh, they're about to blow up some explosives to continue building their tunnel, etc. And then you have these protesters who are saying, let the mountain live, let the mountain live. Basically saying, leave nature alone, live with nature, live in accordance with nature, be harmonious with nature instead of destroying it, you know, to make way for whatever, whatever is more convenient for us, right? <clears throat> Pardon me. All right. So now, um, what happens immediately after they blow up their explosives is that the mountain, it's, they hear this grumbling and all the guys on the inside, the government people, they run out of, they run out of the mountain and there's this huge explosion, which leaves what looks like some sort of a crater or something here. So this reaches the prime minister and the government officials, and they're all checking out the, the views of it. She says, this is the prime minister. She says, oh my God, it looks like it could be a meteor crater. That's one of the, that right there is conditioning. Okay. That's. Mainstream academics tells us that anytime we see some kind of a hole in the ground or something, it came from a rock that fell into the earth from above. While those things do happen, sometimes it comes from below. Sometimes there are explosions that come up from below um, that, that create holes in our world, right? 
Um, and there's other factors that are, we're, we're going to check out here too. Now, the paleontologist team, exactly like in Jurassic Park, is all celebrating. You know, they found a fossil, etc. She's about to give a speech, but all of a sudden, helicopters come in, government helicopters, and they say, we're here to escort you to Oslo immediately. Right? Exactly like in Jurassic Park, whenever they're at their excavation site and, uh, you know, the bearded guy comes in with his helicopter, it's the same exact scenario. So she's escorted to Oslo. She goes inside. Uh, the, I didn't do much on the symbol behind her, but basically that's the symbol for, um, for St. Olaf or, or the king, King Olaf, who basically introduced Christianity all across Norway. And that's going to be a huge part in this movie too. So she walks in on these government officials. They're like, Skrr, who are you? Who are you? What's going on here, right? But they, she was actually sent for because of her skills. Now, this guy is a total disbeliever. He goes, paleontology? Really? <laughs> Just like that, right? Um, which is crazy because that's, that's and, you know, that's one of their things they do in academics is paleontology. Uh, but it's, even then, dinosaurs are too far-fetched for these politicians. So he says, yes, well... I guess we can cross dinosaurs off the list. Just being, just, just mustering up as much evil and selfishness and yuckiness as he possibly can to just throw a wrench into everybody's system, right? He's, he's basically a troll in the movie Trolls. So they're all looking at images of the surrounding areas. And it says here, somebody is, somebody's narrating and they say, there's a series of indentations that were discovered around the landscape. Let's have a look at these indentations, shall we? What does that indentation resemble to you, <laughs> right? What does it look like? All right, we'll come back to that in a second. So everyone else, all the, all the political people, all the government people are trying to figure out what these indentations are, right? And they're like, oh, it could be sinkholes, actually, you know, whenever there's enough methane buildup, etc. It could also be the accumulation of large subterranean pockets of gas. Look at her face right? She's the main character. She's the true seeker in the movie um, who's who's on her little path. But she can't believe what she's hearing from all these people. She can see it with her own eyes. She knows what it is, just like many of you know what it is. But all these people are throwing out these weird scientific suggestions of these alternate things when they're not seeing what's right in front of them. Yes, uh, another consequence of global warming is, you know, what these indentations are. She's like, are you joking? Everyone sees that they're footprints, Right. But sometimes people can't see what's right in front of their face. Um, it's 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 hidden in plain sight. It's because they're blind. Uh, so speaking of giant footprints, here are some examples. These things can be found across the world, worldwide. They're all over the place. But remember how tiny we are. <laughs> Not just in stature, but we're tiny. Our, we, we've shrunken in our ability to be creative and to see things for what they are. Many, many gigantic, sometimes titanic footprints have been found the world across, all over the place, uh, from the Middle East to here in America, to Australia, all the way, of course, to Norway. All over the place, we have clear cut evidence. These are not Photoshopped. These are not doctored or anything. At least they don't appear to be to me. They look genuine and authentic. And many of these pictures have been around for quite some time too. Um, and these are places where you can go. You can go to these places and you can see these huge, gigantic places where giants have stepped. And wherever they stepped, wasn't always rock. It's not like the giant was so heavy that he indented the rock itself. It would have broken the rock itself, right? Which means that that substance was not always rock. It was not always as solid and dense as you see it today, which should uh, give us many other ample highways of research um, when we consider the implications, right? When we look at strange petroglyphs or not petroglyphs, when we look at strange rock formations worldwide, uh, there's even... There's even a legend, a myth, a folktale here in America of a giant named Paul Bunyan with an equally large ox, a blue ox, one of his best friends named Babe. And the legend says that Paul Bunyan walked all over Minnesota and everywhere he stepped was an indentation that left behind the Great Lakes. Here's some more examples. Uh, if we have giant footprints, we've got to find some giant petrified feet somewhere in the world, right? There are many. They're all over the place. Giants once roamed about. Titans. This one is not actually a real 
<laughs> like this is a park that's up in Fort Collins that I visited. That's me on top of it right there. But this is a giant park. And the entire theme of this park is there's giant pieces that are sunken down into the ground because the giants, many of them that weren't petrified, sank and during worldwide liquefaction of worldwide earthquakes that were going off, bringing the water to the top and creating a muddy like swamp like atmosphere where the huge giants had nothing to do when they weren't on bedrock, but to sink down into the ground. So many of them sink. And that's one reason why so many of them are said to be afraid of water or they don't like swimming or rain or stuff like that. So this girl comes up, she's sort of a hacker, right? But she's a cool person. She's a cool little, you know, she's not like she watches Star Trek. She's clearly a black sheep and a nerd and stuff. But check this out. So she's doing her little thing on her laptop. But I noticed on her laptop, she's got all these different stickers. One of them is of Toad. This creature is called Toad, even though he's he's not a Toad. He's a Mushroom Man from the Mario Brothers. Now, this is this is Toad from the mush, uh, the Mushroom Man from the Mario Brothers. The Mario Brothers has a backstory that most people are not aware of, except for those who got the original Nintendo Entertainment System in the '80s. And the original Mario Brothers, which came with a little, a little, a little piece of paper that had a little backstory for the Mario Brothers. Let's check it out. One day, the kingdom of the peaceful mushroom people was invaded by Koopa, a tribe of turtles famous for their black magic. The quiet, peace-loving mushroom people were turned into stones. So even in the game Super Mario Brothers, they have petrification as a weapon, right? Now we go over to uh, what looks like George Carlin and his wife or somebody. Oh, Carlin, remember that? Interesting. And they're, uh, they're out in the middle of Norway and they're just eating or something when all of a sudden, boom, shakes they zoom in on the cup it's all vibrating exactly like in jurassic park right so it's making little ripples they jump into the basement they're like we got to get out of here there's an earthquake or something so they go hide down in the basement which is a good idea oftentimes i find that the movies are throwing us little breadcrumbs of survival tips right for what happens when the stuff hits the fan get down get underneath the ground go into your basements or, or whatnot right to hide from these things so some sort of devastation reeks across uh, this little valley where they live, tearing their house in half. And as you can see, it looks like there's a footprint right there as well. So we go back to the government people and they're like, are you claiming, they're talking to the paleontologist, are you claiming that it's a hominid? Give me a break. Even then, they saw the video and they saw that there's some sort of giant creature with arms and legs, two arms and two legs. And she's like, yeah, it looks like it's a hominid. It looks like a giant. And they're like, oh, give, that's fantasy. That's fiction. Like they, they can't reconcile it in their minds because they're so attached to mainstream academics. So what you're proposing here is that it's a giant chimp. Right now they're all chiming in there. It's like this gang group mentality where they have to, all of them are starting to get worried that their worldviews are being destroyed by what's happening, by what is being presented to their actual eyeballs. This guy says, King Kong, perhaps, huh? 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 Trying to joke. But in reality, yes, it's very much like King Kong. Check this out. Did you know that the word Kong means king? So King Kong is redundant. It's a redundancy, which means it equates to the king of kings. King Kong means the king of kings. He's a type of Atlas that holds up the sky. He's a type of that blue beam figure. And he represents symbolically, as do many of these giants. It could be Godzilla. It could be Troll. It could be King Kong, etc. They represent the time when gigantic growth was reintroduced into our world due to environmental changes, right? So she says, this thing seems to be over 150 feet tall. And one guy's like, that would be unnatural, <laughs> right? That would be unnatural. Yeah, it would be un unnormal, right? It would be not normal for the things that we're used to seeing in our world. And this guy chimes in. He's the advisor to, um, to the prime minister. And he says, or super natural, right? Hey, I got a donation. Uh, overprotected 111 says, uh, 20 bucks. Thank you. Oh my God. Hey, welcome to my channel. It's good to have you. Thank you. All right, cool. Uh, so now they're going to go, they're, they're taking her on a journey on the helicopter to go find this uh, troll, right? Nobody's admitting that it's a troll. No one's even admitting that it's a giant humanoid at all. They don't, they can't face that. She says, my dad has a huge heart. So she's got this backstory with this crazy dad that taught her all this stuff about fic fictitious beings and times of fantasy and the reality, the grains of truth of how those things were real at one time. And she loved it when she was a kid, but then she grew up, right? She became 
she became like adult and so much better than that. So now she sides with those things being more as fiction and false and lies. So she says, my dad had a huge heart and an even bigger imagination. So eventually he kind of lost touch with reality. Let me tell you something that that happens from time to time, right? Especially those people who dig a little deeper than most do, uh, they end up disappearing. I mean, they're still there in the world. But symbolically, they're digging so deep that other people can't recognize them anymore. They can't see them any longer, just like Tesla, right? And many other geniuses from times past. Tesla had an obsession with pigeons and an aversion to women wearing earrings, contributing to his reputation as an eccentric. He suffered a nervous breakdown when he was young, and he may have had dementia before he died. Or, that's the official story, welcome Mr. C, or he didn't. Right? Or he was on to things that other people couldn't comprehend because he was a flipping genius and other people were just seeing the way he was acting. Tesla, Tesla, you know, one thing I really like that Tesla did is he didn't like how much time it actually took out of his day. He added up all the time that it took him to open his closet and to pick out a wardrobe every day because they had so many different styles and clothing and stuff. So he just, he bought all the same clothing so that he didn't have to, so that he could save all of that time. So that's eccentric. Uh, to the rest of the world. So she says, she's quoting her dad. She says, you have to believe in something to see it. My dad always said. So they land the helicopter. They meet this guy, Captain Chris. And he said, uh, she says, my name is Nora. Uh, so we find out the protagonist's name. Her name is Nora. What does Nora mean? Nora is akin to shining light. Just like in many, many of our truth in movies breakdowns, the, one of the main characters, their name usually means some sort of a light or a shining or a glow or a glimmer or something like that, right? So she represents the truth seeker. She represents the shining light of those who seek after the truth, right? Even though she doesn't accept all of the truth that now we're watching her on her path as she grows. So she's interviewing uh, George Carlin and his wife uh, who had their house torn apart by the troll. And they said it was as if we were in the shadow of the mountain, right? Because she was like, was it sunny? You know, were the clouds out? And they're like, no, it's like we were in the shadow of the mountain. Being in the shadow of the mountain, of course that can happen. You know, sh mountains cast shadows and whatnot, but it's also, um, it's a saying that go goes all the way back to Mount Maru. Mount Maru is, the, is said to be the tallest, loftiest tower mountain in the world, located in the direct middle of our world at the North Pole. And the legends say that it was so tall or that it is so tall that as the sun goes around it, that it actually acts like a clock and it casts a shadow, right? From the sun all over the place. And you can be in the shadow of the mountain at many different times of the day. So she says, um, you know, do you remember anything else? Can you, can you recall anything? And he goes, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm still in shock, which is interesting that he chose those words right? Because this is um, symbolically, you know, the, the apocalypse that we're being shown or what happens when the conditions in our world change, allowing for gigantic growth. Those shocks come from above, just like we talked about with uh, Carlin Maggie, right? Those shocks come from the sky. The electricity comes from the sky. He's still in shock. He has amnesia. That's what happens to many people in this world that don't remember the old ways or, or, or the modern age after the apocalypse. So many people are just thrown into a state of utter shock, just like all of those politicians and people at that table. They can't believe it. It messes with their minds. And uh, his wife says when the troll was going along or whenever, whenever, whatever it was, it sounded like it was singing a melody, like it was singing a sad song or something, right? Uh, and then they're outside looking for the troll and she goes, what is that smell? Yeah, it's, it's like hyper nature because one guy's like, it just smells like nature. But she's like, no, no, no. It's like an abundance of nature. It's like a lot of nature. It's like too much nature smell, right? And that's because these giants, these trolls were... Uh, they're huge, right? It's not like they had gigantic clothing to just put on during the day or whatever. No, man, they, they for the most part, strolled around naked or, you know, maybe a loincloth or, or whatever it was that their f tiny family members made for them. Um, and they were so big, you know, stuff would grow on their skin and they sort of became earthly, very earthly, uh, earthy crunchy, as some people say. Now, here's the footprint that the, the troll left behind. She's standing right inside of it. 
And then we go to a place called Stein Budalin in Jotunheim. Stein Budalin. So let's check out that etymology on that word real quick. The, now, the, the word Stein, I didn't have to worry, look it up, means stone. Okay, so it means rock or stone. Now, Budalin comes from the Ottoman Turkish, which is Budala, from the Arabic, uh, Abdal. And basically, it means a substitute, uh, a good religious man or a saint. So the saintly rock or a substitute for a rock, just like the trolls were. They were substitutes for rocks. They were kind of like living rocks themselves. Stein Budalin uh, can also mean uh, or translates into the Stone Bud Valley. There's another valley reference too, just like the lands at the North Pole. Now, they have to go to the expert, which she knows is her father, Crazy Old Dad or whatever. I forgot what the dad's name was. I want to call him Crazy Old Maurice. But anyways, uh, she knows that the dad knows some stuff and, and this, she's like, this is probably a troll. I don't want to say the word troll, but I'm going to go ask my dad. So the dad's checking out the footage and stuff. And she's that she's like, you got to come with us, dad. You got to talk to these people. And she says, no superstition, no fairy tales or fantasy or anything like that. Okay. You know, be, be academic, be professional, dad. The dad's a mountain man. The dad is a, a survivor. He's like, did you know? that Norway imposed the maximum penalty for contact with trolls up until 1840. I looked this up. This is true, right? They had laws prohibiting people to make contact with trolls, to talk to trolls, because the legends say that some trolls were helpful. Some trolls had access to information uh, and they could answer a lot of questions. They could be very helpful, right? So some people actually went out of their way to find trolls to befriend them in the ancient times. So some countries actually had laws prohibiting contact uh, with trolls. Now, according to the story, King Magnus modernized the laws of Norway in 1276. He made it illegal to attempt to wake up mound dwellers is what they referred to as. They wandered freely a thousand years ago. It's the truth. And if you look up Historical records from a thousand years ago, you'll see some strange anomalous accounts of people who seem to have met strange and otherworldly gigantic creatures. She says if the trolls really lived here, so now she starts arguing with her dad, even though like it's weird. There's all these little levels, right? It's like she walks in as a paleontologist and all the government officials are like, dinosaurs, that's stupid. Get out of here. So then she, the same thing happens to her when she walks into her dad's house and she's like, dad, trolls, that's stupid. Get out of here. Right? So she says, if the trolls really lived here, now listen to what she says, because this is the response by many people who are hypnotized by mainstream academics. She says, if the trolls really lived here, scientists, <laughs> sci scientists, which scientists? I don't just, I don't scientists, just some of them somewhere. There's some scientists, you know what I mean? People always say that they always say science says, or scientists have discovered or scientists have done. What scientists, if there was, I mean, tell me who it was, you know what I mean? They don't, they just, they just, they sit comfortably, right? Wherever they are living. And they just trust that other people who are called scientists are doing all of the research for you on your on your behalf they're doing it all for you they're the ones who are, are learning and researching and doing stuff and you don't need to worry about it you just need to trust in the system and trust in the government and the scientists that we provide so she starts uh giving her excuses she says that scientists would have found dna profiles or troll fossils in sedimentary rocks i can tell you that there are people who have done dna tests on various rock samples and have found that DNA that she's talking about. Troll fossils and sedimentary rocks and their extinction could be explained. Listen, let me tell you something. One, some things were petrified and those bonds became stronger bonds and they petrified and they were turned into statues or whatnot. Now imagine that it's a really big statue and it falls. It's probably going to break into pieces or something. But sometimes the legends say that they didn't simply just turn into stone instantaneously, but many of these things that were petrified exploded. Okay. Like they were obliterated. So the dad says, Oh, and then she says to her dad, oh, and also, why does no one else know th about this except for you? 
That's not true. That's not true whatsoever. And this is something that many truth seekers are told as a retort whenever they're engaged in debate or something. They say, how come no one else knows this except for you, huh? How come you're the only one in the whole world that knows this? Listen, that's an absolute statement. You don't know everyone in the whole world, right? We haven't met all however many people are in the entire earth. Uh, so the reality is that she's lying, <laughs> right? He knows it, and I'm sure there are many other people that know it, right? I mean, I know it. You know, there's other people out there too. And then the dad says, they threw me in a loony bin. They've always known. They've always known. Crazy old Maurice from uh, Beauty and the Beast, Belle's father. This is actually like a trope that you'll see throughout the movies where there's always like this crazy old dad who's usually some kind of an inventor or scientist or mad scientist or something, right? Uh, crazy old Maurice was the village inventor and Belle's father. However, he's considered by the majority of the village to be nuts, to be insane, when in reality, he was a genius. All right, so then they're getting ready to go on their quest to find the troll and um, the assistant to uh, the the assistant dude uh, to the prime minister says, yeah, if you tell a lie enough times, people will take it as the truth. And that couldn't be more true and resonate with me personally that if people are used to hearing lie after lie, and it doesn't have to be a purposeful lie, it could be accidental, it could be ignorant, it could be a lie out of it, a complete ignorance, right? But if people hear it and are exposed to it enough, or if they see things enough, they'll start to believe, which is why I enjoy talking about these things so that we can bring belief back, right? Now, they're out there in the in the valley looking for the troll. It's nowhere to be found, but the tracks have stopped. So the dad's looking at the map. He's researching and he's been prepared for this moment. He says the topography, it doesn't match. Topography is uh, what the land looks like on a map, right? He says that the topography doesn't match. That's interesting because it relates to our modern world. When we compare the new maps or the official academic maps of the world, to the ancient maps of the world, we find all kinds of discrepancies where there are islands, where there are none today, or you know, obviously the, the lands at the North Pole are far removed and have been for quite some time. He says, everything is off. It's just wrong. There's something not right here. And then he says, I still remember the sparkle in your eye when I told you about the secrets of the world. Isn't that a beautiful moment, right? Something beautiful. I mean, for me as a father, I can relate to this, right? Just the sparkle in your eye, especially children, especially those who are a little bit younger and they haven't been all caught up and worn out by the world and the news and politics and academics and stuff. She says, I grew up. Okay. Huh? I grew up. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, if that's the case, I don't want to grow up and I don't feel like I, I, I don't want to be an adult personally. Um, I feel like I am a child. And I also have pointed that out many times that I feel like the entire human race is basically a bunch of children uh, compared to how long we used to live for. Now, as they're talking right after she says, I grew up an eyeball opens up from the mountain or the hill that's right behind them. The troll is laying down. It's camouflaged as a mountain. They didn't even see it. All of a sudden, the, stroll, the troll starts to get up. It's grumbling around. It's, it, it gets up. And you see that? There's a tail right there. That's interesting that they chose to put a tail on this troll, right? Trolls are giants, okay? They're, ju they're just giant creatures. After our world depressurizes, right, and everything starts to hit equilibrium and settle back down, all of your children or the, the children of the survivors and their progeny going into the new conditions in our world, they'll start growing to gigantic proportions and huge sizes, some of them over time starting to take on the appearance of what look like trolls. So if trolls, let's just be hypothetical about it, if trolls or if giants are actually humans or were humans in, in the long times past in Auld Lang Syne, right? Or in our future that is yet to come. If they're humans, why do they put a tail on this? Because we don't have tails, right? We do. It says here, why do humans have a tailbone, but no tail? It says in Google, humans do have a tail, but it's only for a brief period during our embryonic development. It's most pronounced at around day 31 to 35 of gestation. And then it regresses into the four or five uh, fused vertebrates becoming our coccyx. In rare cases, the regression is incomplete and usually surgically removed at birth. Let me just paraphrase that in regular speak, okay? In regular people talk. 
What that means is that humans are born with tails. And if your tail doesn't turn into a tail bone or whatever and just kind of fall off or whatever, or whatever whatever it is that happens, right? If, it, if that doesn't happen and you're born with the tail, the hospitals cut your tail off. That's what that means, right? Um, there are many, many examples of humans with tails on the internet. I'm not going to show you any of them because... You know, sometimes they show naked bodies or sometimes it can look kind of grotesque because you're not used to seeing it. But I put this picture of the, the, the Navi from Avatar up so that you can see this is, this is what it would look like if our tails continued to grow, basically. So it makes sense that they added a tail onto this gigantic humanoid troll which wakes up and starts chasing the helicopter everywhere. They're live streaming this back to, you know, the government facility. And she says, what in the hell is that? Really? What in the hell is that? Do you see how blind they are? They're face to face with a giant and she can't eat. She's asking, what is it? I'm blind still. I'm blind. I'm, I'm still holding on to all my old beliefs and all my old teachings and all my old ways from modern academics. I can't cross that barrier into the old ways, which are returning. What is it? What is that? That's so strange. It's a giant. It's a troll. It is, you know what I mean? It's an ogre or whatever you want to call it, right? I mean, there's different classifications, but basically there's just giant humanoids. Now, they're going into this meeting with the government people. She tells her dad, swear you won't say the word troll. They get into the meeting and they're like, troll? What do you mean troll? Because the dad starts saying, that's a troll. <laughs> like, he's not holding his tongue. He doesn't care about being politically correct. He's like, this is a troll. And they're like, what do you mean troll? Huh? Right? They know what a troll is. They're asking this question because their minds are hitting a roadblock. They're literally asking, what do you mean troll? It's evident. It is a troll. But their minds don't allow them. There are roadblocks. There are what I call web form spells that have been cast over most of the world where people run into these roadblocks mentally and they can't go any further because that's what they're used to. So the dad yells. He's like, this is a troll. <laughs> like, what more? What don't you understand about that? So then the daughter picks up and she's like, the point is, we really don't know what kind of creature we're dealing with. So she's trying to be more politically correct. She's trying to sort of build a bridge between these people who are completely blind and her dad who sees the truth, which is it's a troll. So she's like, we really don't know exactly, you know, what it is. There, no. See, she says, we really don't know what it is. This is something that kind of has bothered me for quite some time, uh, especially in academics, right? Anyone who's still holding on to some form or semblance of academia, they constantly, especially those people who follow sports. If you're a sports person, that's fine, whatever. Um, but they say we all the time as if they're included, right? As if it means everyone on earth. We really don't know. We have discovered. We have found. We went to the moon. We won the Super Bowl. Nah, you didn't. We didn't. Some other individual may have, and that's what they told you. That's the reality. Now, the dad says, imagine waking up and he's talking about the troll, right? She's trying to get him, uh, she, he's trying to get her to like uh, sympathize with the troll. He says, imagine waking up and everything you know is gone, just like this troll. However, it's also, the movie's talking directly to us in the modern world because the apocalypse is soon on the way. And he's asking you to consider this. Imagine waking up, waking up and everything that you know is gone. And you live in a brand new world full of mysterious, strange, and otherworldly creatures, gigantic beings who have descended from on high, and other creatures who have come up from inside of the bowels of the earth. Everything you know is gone, swept away in the winds of a tempest. So you wake up to a whole new world, just like Aladdin. <laughs> nature will push back, he says, right? That's what we've done. We've been pushing on nature. We're digging. We're taking it apart. We're like the doozers in uh, Fraggle Rock, basically. And the day will come when nature will reclaim this world. The animals will become kings and queens in their own rights of the earth once more, on top of phantazoids and otherworldly creatures that we talk about on my channel quite often. He says the adventure has just begun which is exciting for us. Our adventure has just begun. We are on the verge, on the precipice of a huge change in environmental conditions in our world that are going to change life and what is considered normal as, as we have encountered it. So they go out into the forest. They're actually setting up a trap for this troll. They're going to try to 
shoot them down, I guess, with little tiny bullets that are like, imagine a giant, right? And you're trying to shoot little bullets at this huge, gigantic creature, right? Whose out, outer portions of its skin have, are so hard and tough that they look and feel like rock, right? That's not going to do anything. <laughs> like You can shoot it with arrows. You can shoot it with missiles and all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, it's going to be like... Um, like an airsoft gun on a human, basically. It might sting a little, be irritating, might even hurt a bit, but it's not It's not going to do a lot of damage. So they're waiting and the military guy, Captain Chris, looks over at the assistant and he's like, hey, do you have military experience? He goes, yeah, a little, a little, because he recognized his uh, NVGs that he's got on his head there. And he's like, Call of Duty, totally played Call of Duty. And then he starts laughing at that, right? But this is the reality. Many of us who are learning these truths from movies or video games or whatever it may be, you still get the experience uh, or, or the information, I should say, right? Not the experience. So this guy knew what the night vision goggles were. He knew exactly what type they were and everything because he played Call of Duty. So he probably has a working understanding of like what they are, how they work, how to use them, which can be helpful when the time comes, right? And he got the information from a video game. This guy's laughing because he thinks it's funny. Ah, ha, ha, video game, you're not really, you know, this and that, but that information can help you in the future. All right, so the troll comes. Of course, the military just wants to destroy it. Why? Pfft, because it, it can't vote, basically. <laughs> like Because the troll can't vote, they're going to kill it, right? Because the troll is not under their guidelines and their orders and their laws and their expectations and their policies. So they know that it's a threat. It's not a threat to humans and individuals because it's not actually going about trying to kill people or anything like that. It's just living its life but it's a threat to their system. It's a threat to their power. It's a threat to the control system that they have set up and put in place to keep all of us as slaves. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're attacking the troll. There's this huge fight that's going on. <laughs> Bombs are blowing up all over the place. Totally doesn't hurt the troll. It's just pissing him off. One of the soldiers is holding on to a crucifix and he begins to pray. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, etc. And the troll stops and it starts smelling as this guy is down there praying and he's smelling. He can smell this dude. And the father, crazy old Maurice, says Christian blood because he knows trolls can smell Christian blood. Let's talk about that. So he picks up the Christian, he swallows him down whole, goes down the gullet. Check this out. Here's a correlation between Troll and AOT or Attack on Titan. I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bigger so you can check it out. Uh, there's an anime called Attack on Titan. It's about Titans and there's a lot of truth in that. We actually broke down Attack on Titan, the movie, in one of our segments. Uh, let's see. It says here about the Titans that they believed to be... Uh, Hold on. It says they cannibalized humans so that they could be free of their never ending nightmare. The Titans in Attack on Titan weren't just simply hungry. And so they just, you know, they thought humans were delicious snacks. They weren't even eating them for, for nourishment. They were, they were devouring humans in the hopes that devouring a human would restore them to their prior state, that it would shrink them back down to size so that they could be normal again and not be these huge, gigantic outcasts with no friends and no family or whatever, right? After this discovery, the horrifying revelation shook many of the people in Attack on Titan because they believed the Titans to be fighting monsters. They believed that they were fighting monsters, not humans. Right? Doesn't that change things? If uh, if there's a huge gigantic being or something like this, and you see it as a human instead of as some monster, right? If it's a monster, the first thing we th we're taught is kill it, kill it, get rid of it, step on it, you know, spray it with raid or or whatever, right? Um, but if it's a human, you start seeing things differently. Now. This is directly related to uh, many ancient stories where there is a giant that traditionally says something along the lines of fee, fi, full, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Now, it's different across time. If we look way back, it was actually uh, from Tom Thumb in 1621, and he says, fee, fum. It says, fee, fe, foul, fun. I smell of a dangerous man. Be he alive or be he dead. I'll grind his bones to make my bread. But 
There's another version. Jack the Giant Killer in 1761 says, Fee, foul, fum. I smell the blood of an Englishman. Now, it went from dangerous man to Englishman. And it went from Englishman uh, to Christian man over time. This has changed, right? So it wasn't always that trolls smelled the blood of a Christian specifically, but of somebody who is seen to them as being a danger. Now, this is actually really interesting. Um, this is a different version. And um, I didn't see where I actually got this from, but this is another version. It says, fee fi fo foam, I smell the blood of an Englishman. And if he have any liver and lights, I'll have them for my supper tonight. Liver and lights? lights so the giant sees a light there's some sort of a light and he wants to eat the light that's interesting that's also directly related to attack on titan check this out the titans like i said they eat humans in hopes of regaining their humanity not because they're hungry right but when they look down and they see all the little humans scurrying about it says that titans target humans because they literally glow in the eyes of the predators. So in the eyes of the Titans and Attack on Titan, the humans glow, which means that they have the ability to read their chakras or their aura or their spirit, right? Those who have a much stronger spirit glow brighter. Let your light shine brightly before men, as the Bible says. Um, and this is actually a creature from Attack on Titan. This is the original creature, this thing, they call it like the glowing caterpillar or centipede or something like that. But the creature attached to this girl whose name is Emir in uh, Attack on Titan, and it turned her into a Titan. This creature is plasma. This creature represents plasma. It is not some weird alien thing or whatever. It's plasma. Now check this out. We're talking about Christians who are anointed, right? Now let's, let's, let's learn a bit deeper. It says baptized members of the Christian faithful who have reached the age of reason and who begin to be in danger due to sickness or old age, or I'm sorry, or may receive the sacrament of anointing. So that's something that stands out with Christians versus other religions and whatnot, um, or regular people, you would say, is that they are anointed, right? What does it mean to be anointing? It means that you are, the, the word Christ um, if you go back to the roots, it sort of implies to shine, uh, to have a shining about you, to be a shining one. Now, we're, we're talking about actual shining, actual light that your spirit shined, that your soul on the inside became overly amplified and you are a, a light being, right? But once that disappeared, people tried other methods of making themselves to be shiny and appear to be shiny, right? So they actually started covering themselves in oil and whatnot. So let's check out the anointing oil in uh, Catholicism at the very least here. Actually, this goes back to the Hebrew roots. It says anointing oil ingredients. Now I want you to Think about this. Think about these ingredients and tell me if this sort of reminds you of anything and why a troll might want to eat a person who has this on them. Anointing oil ingredients. The Lord God gave Moses instructions on the ingredients to use when making holy anointing oil in Exodus. They included the most delicate spices, measured in shekels, 500 liquid uh, myrrh, 250 sweet smelling cinnamon, 500 kasha, 250 aromatic cane, and a hint of olive oil. Mm. So they poured that onto the initiates or whatnot. They covered them in all these oil and spices and whatnot, right? Sometimes in today's modern world, usually it's, you know, they just wipe a little bit on you or on your hand or something. But not in the old times. In the old times, you were covered, right? Exactly like you would see in somebody's kitchen when they're preparing something to be eaten so that it tastes delicious and smells good when it's cooking. That's literally how it's described as smelling to God of the Old Testament. It's a, it's a, it's a sweet smelling smell. To, so I can see why the troll is, is possibly picking out Christians at, at the very least, right? Uh, they're, they're marinated, basically. <laughs> All right, so the dad goes up to the troll after he just ate the Christian guy, and he's like, well, hello there. All right, all right. And he puts his arms up, right? Doing the squatter man symbolism or the Atlas sign, which means peace, which is the blue beam that shoots up and separates up towards the top, right? And he's letting him know, hey, I'm, I'm here to help you. I'm here. I'm your friend. He actually tells him, I'm your friend. So the, the troll looks down. You could barely see him right here, but he's way down there on the ground. 
I like, I often consider the perspective of gigantic creatures and what it must look like to them, right? Are they actually purposefully singling out an individual to try to step on or whatever? I mean, are you doing that when you walk down the street and there's ants all over the place or grasshoppers or whatever? You might, you know, jump out of the way or whatever, but you're not, most people are not begrudging the ants, right? Like, oh, that one specifically die. You know what I mean? No, that doesn't really happen. Um, but anyways, so he goes to try to make a friends with the troll. The troll's like, oh, well, that's nice. So the troll stops and considers the guy. Uh, but then the military starts shooting at the troll. So he takes off, right? Now the dad has his little form of like Dr. Jones's grail diary, but it's a troll diary. And as you can see, he's highlighted this image here where you have all of these troll like looking creatures and it looks like they're all walking towards this glowing city, some sort of a city that's a glow. And down here it says Heim, which means home, right? So the trolls have a home and they're, they have this destination that they want to get back to. So she's trying to figure out what this means. And she says, let's assume that there's truth to the fairy tales. I like this. I like, let's, you know, let's reserve judgment for a second and just assume that it could be true. Let's speak hypothetically, because then if we can figure out the hypotheticals, then we can ask hypothetically, what are the implications of those, right? They said, but look, look, look at this picture. The troll is roaming the streets in broad daylight. There's so something wrong here. Uh, what other rules, what are, what other rules from fairy tales can we think of, right? So now she's using what used to be, or what is in the modern world considered to be fiction, fake, science, uh, unscientific, right? Uh, stuff from movies and cartoons and video games and stuff. She's saying, Hey, what other rules are there from all of our modern legends and stuff that could help us during this real life? Uh, actual event that's happening, right? Because now we need those. Now we need the old wives tales. Now we need the nursery rhymes. Now we need help from our ancient selves, our forefathers who have passed this information along through time. Um, and it's been cartoonified, but now we might be able to glean from it. So the guy's like, are you serious? Like, really? Really? You're going to talk about nursery rhymes and old legends and stuff like that? Yeah, of course. You're dealing with a troll, man. Like, accept it, right? This guy's like, um, uh, don't feed them after midnight. Is, is that one? And that's supposed to be like a funny joke, right? Because obviously he's referring to the gremlins. The gremlins, there are these rules about gremlins. One of them is avoid bright lights. Trolls also avoid bright lights. They don't like the bright light of the sun. They don't like UV rays. Not just trolls, vampires. Uh, it's basically the races that I that I call the phantazoids. Those those creatures who have not adapted to a focal point up there in the heavens that we call the sun or sunlight or daytime. So it hurts them, right? Their skin is not used to it. They haven't adapted. So it physically actually hurts them, right? It's called photophobia. Uh, so they avoid typically bright lights. And those of you who might be blood related to some of these creatures might also experience these symptoms on a smaller scale. Uh, keep away from water, right? Of course, there's holy water. Um, there's the legends of the giants that are sinking, etc. And don't feed them after midnight. I'm not exactly sure what that one could be related to, but I'm sure that one's important as well. All right, so we go back to this book. She's looking through this troll diary once more. And you can see there's sort of like this church building and a huge boulder right next to it. Uh, I couldn't read any of this because it's written in Norwegian uh, and it's scribbled. So I couldn't even make out the letters. So they go back to the government officials and they say, she tells them, look, um, she's showing them pictures from the internet of like the, the boulders and the churches and stuff. And she says, listen, old myths make reference to trolls throwing boulders at churches because they hated the sounds of of the bells. The bells were hurting the trolls' ears. They couldn't stand it. So they rose up and they threw huge boulders at these churches to destroy the bells. Now this guy, the troll, right? The government troll is like, oh, this just keeps getting better and better. You know what I mean? Just really trying to stick it to this girl because he just, he, he, he can't do it. He's already planted his flag. He's on team government, team academics or whatever, and he's not going to do it. His reputation's on the line. He doesn't want to be laughed at. He, you know what I mean? He wants to be the person doing the laughing. He wants to be a troll. This keeps getting better and better. 
So Captain Chris is like, listen, man, we got to think outside of the box. Things, conditions have changed, right? So now we need to change as well to adapt. So we go to this amusement park in Norway that's all fairy tale themed. As you can see, they have a statue of like a giant troll right there. Everyone's walking by, having a good time, it's sort of a water park and stuff. There's a, a mascot who's walking around like a troll. This is a perfect example of what I call cartoonification of ancient truths right? This is a cartoonification. Before that, this was the cartoonification. And the reality stands above the cartoonification, right? The reality makes its presence known. So the real troll stands above the two versions of itself. And there's this ominous music that's playing. Now look at, again from the troll's perspective. I mean, you can barely even see the humans down there. Look how far away they are, right? So it's not like the troll is looking for someone specifically or anything like that, right? He's just walking around. He sees everyone freaking out. But, you know, I mean, that's what the ants do, right? Same exact principles, same exact concept. So the troll's looking around. This busted me up. This had me dying laughing. So there's this little water rapids ride or whatever. And this, this family is in there like in this little boat and the dude just ditches everybody. He just jumps off the boat. He's like, later family, I'm out of here. He just takes off. Uh, and then of course we see the troll standing above everybody. And then we hear the bells and the troll looks over and he sees in the distance that there are these helicopters that are coming in with bells. Now check this out. Between 1939 and 1945, over 175,000 bells across Europe were taken by Nazi Germany. They were transported to collection points known as Glockenfriedhofe or bell cemeteries. Isn't that interesting? Check out some of these pictures where all of uh, the German troops went and confiscated all of these church bells from all of these towers, thousands upon thousands, hundreds, or at least over a hundred thousand, right? Of bells upon bells. So they broke them down, they melted them down, they used them for other stuff. But I don't believe that that's the reason why they actually took them. Remember, Hitler was strongly into the occult. I mean, he was looking for the spear of destiny, probably the fountain of youth, etc. Do you think he might have had some knowledge of trolls and all these bells in his enemy's land and territory that could protect them from trolls? Possibly right? Which harkens back to a quiet place too, right? <clears throat> Think about it, right? After the apocalypse, all of the noise of this world will be gone, right? Everything will be silenced and it will be so quiet that for some of you, it might actually be too quiet. It might be overwhelmingly like loud with quietness, right? But imagine those other creatures, those other worldly beings from other places that come down into this super quiet world, the legends indicate that they might have excellent hearing, maybe not so good eyesight, but very good hearing, right? And imagine a titan, right? Something that's huge, gigantic ears and everything. Maybe they can hear a lot better, right? So they're affected more by sound and frequencies. So I looked up how many decibels is a church bell. The intensity of the sound on the point where the bell ringer is situated is between 100 and 125 decibels depending on the bell. So if we look up noise levels and we go to, uh, let's see, let me zoom in here so you can check it out. Now this line represents where sounds start becoming harmful to your ears, right? And this is only at 80 to 89 decibels. So the church bells are much higher than that. Uh, up here closer towards like rock concerts, sports crowds, a loud symph uh, symphony and stuff like that. So imagine if that sound is amplified to creatures who have even better hearing, right? I could understand why the trolls would be like, ah, you know, turn that off. So they fly in. Dun, 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 bong, bong. The bells are ringing. The troll can't stand it. He's drops down to one knee. He's trying to get rid of these snags, a helicopter right out of the air. I don't know what they were thinking flying that close, right? I mean, they have to, I guess, right? But uh, he just yoinks a helicopter right out of the air and uses it as a club to like start smashing the other helicopters. It's pretty epic. The helicopter is about to smash this little girl in the theme park when all of a sudden the troll stops it snatches it right out of the air and saves the little girl's life. And then he looks at the little girl like, yeah, I got you. No problem, right? Now, the reporters on the news start reporting and it says, we're on the ground here in Norway and it's a nation in panic. 
I was talking about Jurassic Park references to this movie earlier. Is it just me or does this guy look exactly like this guy? <laughs> right? I mean, it could be a coincidence. I don't know, but it's definitely very close to another. This is Norwegian Jurassic Park, basically. All right. So we've got all the newscasters and they're all reporting on it. And now this is breaking. This is breaking worldwide news, right? They were trying to cover it up. They're trying to hide it, but they can only do it for so long in the modern age before the newscasters got a piece of it. This girl actually says that they left a trail of destruction, hearkening back to the origins of the word troll. The troll, the trailblazers, the trail leavers, those who you can clearly see where they went, right? Because they are gigantic. Uh, here's another one. So they're showing all these special reports and stuff. Now, uh, the government lady, I forgot who she is. Oh, the prime minister, right? Says this is a threat that must be stopped by force. This is what happens when you push the governments of your worlds back up against the wall and you threaten their system that that keeps everybody in invisible handcuffs and makes nice little slaves of everyone. They're like, this is a threat. Is it a threat to her personally? Maybe, but it's more of a threat to their way of life, to their way of life, right? Not to ours. To us, it would be liberating because it would de completely destroy the system and overthrow everything. She says, this is a threat and not hocus pocus. It's interesting that she chose those specific words, hocus pocus, right? Hocus Pocus comes from magic words, allegedly, that were said by ancient Catholic and pagan priests alike whenever they held a ritual where just before dawn, they would go out and they would hold up a wafer and they would allow the first rays of the light of the sun to touch this wafer. And they would basically symbolically, this is called transubstanti uh, transubstantiation. And basically they would say that the, the wafer would absorb the light of the sun. And symbolically, this was like Jesus and his body going into the wafer, etc. But they would hold up this wafer to the first rays of light in the early morning dawn. And they would repeat the Latin words, hoc est corpus meum, which means this is my body. Now, those who are uneducated in Latin right? Who weren't taught Latin because it was a hidden language and only for the chosen and the elect, et cetera, uh, for the most part, right? Um, now it's known as a dead language too, which it's it's not. It's just an esoteric language that most people don't know. Hocus corpus mean means this is my body. To those who are uneducated and watching and listening, they heard hocus pocus, that there was some sort of magic ritual happening and this bread was going to change into an actual body of Christ or whatnot, right? So this is this is why magicians would say hocus pocus and then you know something would change, basically. That's the origin of that. So she's like, turn around. Oh my God, I figured it out. Home, Heim, the trolls are trying to go home. This troll's trying to, to go home. He's headed right towards the capital, Oslo, which we're going to talk about in a minute too. Uh, he's, he's headed towards the capital. He's going home. Now, check this out. It's going towards the palace. The troll's home is in the palace. If you look up the word palace, this is very interesting. It comes from palace, P-A-L-U-S, palace, which means a stake, a beam, a pole, a plank, a rod, a column, right? These are the places, the palaces are... Um, this is also where we get the word city from. The ancient word for city is polis, right? These were the places where the smaller beams of light would exit through certain cavernous systems around the world, right? Because there's many inner earth entrances. Some are bigger, some are smaller, but this is where people set up their cities because they wanted to be near these fountains of youth. They wanted to be near these beams of light that, that not only gave light so that they could see better, but seemed to um, have... Uh, imbue properties that were beneficial to humans, you know, health and living and, and things like that. So this is why their cities were all built around these magical fountains, these beams of light, these poles that shot up from the earth itself. And the leader of the city would like all of that power that's coming up, all that energy that's coming up from inside of the earth for themselves. So oftentimes they would build a palace or a, a place where the strong pole, the pole oz, right? The place where the pole came out of the earth or the energetic beam, like the beam of energy comes up out of the earth. They would build these huge, huge uh, mansions and stuff on top of them in order to keep all of that energy to themselves so that they could live for a very long time because that's one of the byproducts of this is that it allows people to live for a long time. Also, similarly, that's where they would build cathedrals, right? 
so that the people could go to smaller versions and they could go in, in mass and they could get healed, etc. But this is where the word palace comes from, which tells me that it's very likely. And as I was watching the movie, I had never seen this movie. I'm watching it as I'm studying it, okay? So I'm like, man, I'll bet you that there are underground tunnels under most of the palaces in the world, at least, at the very least, the ancient ones, right? If this is true, I would expect there to be underground tunnels, right? Um, palace is also related to the word pale, which comes from the Proto-Indo-European uh, paxlo, uh, a suffixed form of the root pag, right there. That is the root of palace, pag, which is also the root of pagan, the hill people, right? Which means to fasten. It's a fastener. It is a nail. It is a tent peg. And it is also the vav, which people are usually afraid of because it's a part of 666 symbolism, basically. It's a doublet of the word pole. All right, cool. So here is the royal palace, right? This is a huge building. Take a look at this because you're going to see this in all of the palaces, most of them, world, the world across. Do you see this? Look, they have uh, all of these little pillars and columns that are not even touching the ground. They're like raised up, you know, like two, three stories or something into the sky. And then they have these poles and these pillars and these columns on the palaces themselves, right? Um, because I believe that it's energetic and they're using these poles, not only as, as symbols of the place where the, the beams would shoot up or the columns would shoot up out of the earth, but also possibly uh, to direct the energy or to direct the flow of energy. So this is one of the palaces I uh, highly encourage you checking out all of the architecture of various palaces worldwide, and you'll see much similarities. So they go to the palace, right? And this is after I already started like thinking about underground places under the, the palaces, right? So they go to this guy who's at the palace, and he says, I can count on one hand the number of living people who have seen what you are about to see. So the, the movies are telling you this is a secret. Most people don't know this. Most people don't check this out. Opens up these huge metallic doors in the basement of the palace where their parking garage is underground. And lo and behold, it is a huge cavernous system that goes underneath the palace. That's got electricity in there. It's, it's got lights and stuff. It says electricity buzzing. Could be because of the lights in the movie, but it's also because it's charged with electricity from the inner earth, right? So uh, they said this was the home of the troll king. The troll king used to live under the palace. So the humans destroyed the troll king and they took over the building. They took over or they set up their own building or however it was that, that it happened. But they took over this place of power. I call them places of power. It could be cathedrals. It could be palaces, etc. But they are places where humans built buildings on top of these cavernous systems in order to contain the inner earth drill or energy that comes up out of the earth, right? So that they can live longer, etc. The king is making his way back to the castle, she said. Oh my God, the king is coming home. The king is actually on his way back to the castle, which reminded me of modern times, where if you look at the north, the magnetic north pole and you follow it and track it over time, it was way over there in the 1900s, but it's it's been on a journey. It's been on a quest. Where is this magnetic north pole going? Jeez, it's going home. It's going back home. And when it gets home, guess what? Boom. Apocalypse. All right. So uh, there's also a huge skull of these other, you know, troll babies and stuff like that. And he's like, he's going home, right? Exactly like our magnetic North Pole is headed home right now. And if it misses the North Pole, the true geographic North Pole, I'll bet you it turns around. I'll bet you it starts spiraling right there. That's just my guess. But anyways, he says, in a world gone mad, then only the crazy can be seen. Because the girl's saying like, I'm starting to feel crazy, man. Like, am I nuts? Am I nuts? Right? He's like, no, in a world that is crazy, the crazy people are the sane ones. Those people, those of us who think that we're crazy or whatever, uh, if you're surrounded by a bunch of people who are nuts and off their rockers, like the world seems to be today, then you're in good company. If you're crazy old Maurice, if you're the weirdo, if you're the black sheep or the outcast, you're in good company. Okay. So am I. All right. So the troll comes up on the palace right? He's headed towards his destination. And they put, this part gets kind of sad for a lot of us, I feel like. It was super sad for me, but they actually teased him. They put the head of like 
allegedly like his his son from a thousand years ago or whatever, like this skull of this baby troll on the back of a truck and they take off and he sees it and he starts following after it. They're trying to take him away. They're trying to di divert him from getting to his destination, which is his home, the palace or the place of the pole. Uh, so uh, he picks up the skull after chasing after them and he basically starts crying like a, only a troll can cry. And man, it... I know a lot of people in the chat were like, I, I super was crying. <laughs> it's sad, right? For some of us, for, the, for most people in the world, let me tell you this. Most people in the world, they wouldn't cry at that. Most people in the world wouldn't be sad at that. They wouldn't be touched. You know what I mean? They would just be like, that's a monster. You know what I mean? Like, hurry up and kill it. Hurry up and kill it, basically. So they realize UV light can hurt this thing. So they get these huge UV lights in the military and they surround the troll and he starts steaming and hissing and stuff. And he's, he's starting to feel pain and he roars. But then Nora, who, whose name means shining or light, right? She goes and turns all the lights off because she grows a heart and she's like, this is wrong, man. We're killing this thing. Like it, it, didn't even do anything to us. It's just reacting, right? So she yells at the troll. She's like, go back to the mountains. Go, just, just take off, just go. But as she's talking, the sun starts to come up and the troll didn't have enough time to get back to his home and the sunlight starts to hit him and he starts groaning and crying out as his skin starts to harden. Now, listen, this could be because of actual sunlight and photophobia, right? You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if it would turn somebody into a rock or whatnot, but symbolically, it's also the time when that point of focus that we call the sun, when it reappears, because it will disappear, okay? And then uh, everything up there in the heavens is going to change and look altogether different. But there will come a time when the, when w the sun that we're used to seeing will come back, okay? Usually when the pressure builds back up and stuff like that, but the sun comes back. And when the sun starts to come back, that's right around the time when all of these giant creatures have faded away and they're starting to disappear because they've been hunted, right? There are actual phantozoid hunters, giant killers, and people that are proud of the fact that they are experts at, at killing alien creatures or whatever. Um, and that's right around the time whenever the conditions in our world start to come full circle and the regular point of focus or the sun starts to come back and all these things disappear into what we call old Lang Syne or once upon a time, times long past. So the troll starts turning into rock and uh, there's all the steam and stuff coming off of him. He takes one last look at her, which is the light. And then he turns into rock. He petrifies, lies down and becomes a sleeping giant. And uh, he turns into like a little hill structure. And uh, that's it. That's the end of the movie. They, they want to name it or something like that. But that is our presentation for today. Thanks for recommending this movie to me, by the way. Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, lots of fun things on the way for next year. Um, I'm not going to be doing like a New Year's you know presentation or anything because my son's here. He's watching right now. Shout out to my boy. Um, we're going we're gonna to stay up all night and bring in the New Year together. I have so much to talk about in the upcoming year. I want to thank everyone from the bottom of my heart for all of your support and uh, for watching, for sharing, for liking, for whatever it is you do, just for being a part of my life. Thank you. I enjoy what I do. And in, until next time, I'm Jay Dreamers saying good vibes and goodbye. So hard to fade away.
vast multiverse. Good vibes and good vibes. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All right, cool.